comes to us from 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verses 8 all the way to the end. Uh, we're going to finish our series in 1 Peter today. So, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for gathering us to hear your word, uh, to be instructed by you. And we pray that as we do that now, that you would remove all distractions, that you would meet us here by the power of the Holy Spirit and enlighten our eyes, open our hearts to receive uh, what you would have us to receive. Uh, let us be changed and strengthened and renewed. Help me to get out of the way so that your truth is faithfully procla uh, proclaimed. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Trial of the century, this is a uh, phrase that we hear being used a lot in our uh, culture today. Uh, what do we mean by that? We hear trial of the century. Well, news sources usually take this phrase and use it to, uh, to highlight a trial that's taking place so that everybody pays attention to it, and so it seems like the most important thing that's going on in the world right now, and everybody's watching, right? Uh, trials have become big business in our day over the last 50 or 60 years. Some of you may remember the trial of O.J. Simpson. Uh, everybody in America was watching this trial day to day, watching to see what was going to happen. It's almost as if it turned into a daytime talk show or something like this. Uh, most recently, we've had the trial of Brett Kavanaugh, the uh, Supreme Court justice uh, who was falsely accused of rape, and all America was watching as this trial took place on on national television, and soon we will have the trial of, of Derek Chauvin, uh, the man who is accused of murdering George Floyd, and all the world will be watching. But I tell you, friends, that there is a much more important trial that is taking place, and it is one that has eternal implications, uh, and it is the trial that each one of us face from day to day as Christians. Our life and the hardships uh, that we endure are the trial, if you will. Uh, and many times when we are in the midst of trial, we can begin to ask ourselves where God is at, you know, where, where did he go? Did he forget about us? Is he absent? Is he not paying attention or something like this? Uh, but the answer to that question is that God is right there with you in the midst of your trial. Uh, God has a purpose in our trials, and he is with us in our trials. It is all part of his sovereign plan that he is fulfilling in the world. And so today I want to explore that idea that God is with us uh, in the trial from two uh, separate angles. And the first is that God is Lord over our trials and he has given us weapons to fight with our enemies in them. That is in our trials. And the second is like it. God is Lord over our trials and he will be with us in them and he will deliver us out of them. Okay? So that is our focus today. We're going to look at that first point in verses uh, 8 and 9. And I'll read that again and we'll get to work. Uh, verse 8, we see there, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, 
knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So Peter begins his exhortation here by telling us to be uh, sober-minded and watchful. And these are commands. Uh, For the Christian, this is something that we must do. And throughout Peter's letter, he has told us on three separate occasions that we need to be a sober-minded. So this is sort of a running theme throughout Peter's epistle. And every time that Peter tells us uh, to be sober-minded, he has something specific in mind that he wants us to be clear-headed about. You'll remember to be sober-minded means to be able to see the issues that are before you and to think clearly about them, okay? To be able to see the issues that are before you and to think clearly about them. And early on in his letter, Peter told us that we needed to be able to think clearly about the gospel and the kingdom and its implications for our lives. A couple weeks ago, we talked about being able to think clearly about the world around us and the situation that we find ourselves in. And today, he tells us that we need to be able to think clearly about the reality of the enemy and his tactics. Because the devil is real, okay? Uh, the, the writers, when the, when, the, when the Bible uses the word devil uh, it is or demon, it is not just some way that the writers of Scripture are referring to the inner struggle that somebody has inside of themselves or something like this. No, the Bible is referring to an actual spiritual being when it mentions the devil, who is truly the enemy of God's people. And it has been this way uh, from the very beginning. You will think back uh, to the garden uh, with me, where the enemy attacked God's people right from the very start, bringing the truth of God into uh, question. And he led Adam and Eve astray from the truth of God. And it is no different today And Peter is saying that we must be privy to this reality. It's the same today, and we must be aware of it. We must be on guard. We must think clearly about it, and we we must know how to deal with it when we find it out there in the world when we run into it. So what does he say? Be sober-minded and watchful. Be sober-minded and watchful. That is, we are to be on guard like a watchman in the watchtower. We are to be awake. We're to be alert. We are to go out there into the world with eyes wide open, knowing that we are going to be confronted with evil. And you say, well, what are we looking for? (laughs) Are Are we looking for some sort of black apparition floating around out there wreaking havoc on our families or something like this? No. Uh, you cannot see the devil. The devil is a spiritual being, so he is invisible. But just as you cannot see the wind, but you can see the effects that it has on the world, so you may not be able to see the devil, but you can see the effects that he has on people and things within the world. Peter says, our enemy, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking to devour. Two things that I want to mention here. The devil is our enemy, and he is looking to devour. You see that? The devil is our enemy, and he is looking to devour. If you are a Christian, and you are living a faithful Christian life, the devil is not neutral towards you. He is in opposition to you. Uh, He is actively against you. He is your enemy. And before you were a Christian, the devil could care less about you. And that is because you were doing exactly what he wanted you to do. But the moment that you become a Christian and are baptized into Christ, you have effectively declared war on the devil. And now it is as if you are walking around with a target on your back. 
and he wants to exploit you. He wants to deceive you, and he wants to incapacitate you, and ultimately he wants to destroy you. Why is that? Well, because he knows that Christ and his people are the only way, only thing standing in the way of him taking over the world. See that? Christ and his people are the only thing that stand in the way of the devil taking over the world. It's as simple as this. Jesus effectively hung, hamstrung the devil on the cross, and he's left us in the world to finish the job. He effectively hamstrung the devil on the cross, and he has left us in the world to finish the job. And you ought not to think for a moment that the devil doesn't know it. Again, Christ and his people are the only thing that stand in his way. And Peter is saying, you ought to know it. <laughs> you ought to know that. Uh, let me ask you a question. Well, first, Again, Peter says, the devil is like a, a roaring lion. The devil's like a roaring lion. Now let me ask you a question. If you knew that there was a lion running around out there in the streets, would you not look twice before you went out the door? But I tell you, friends, that is effectively what we do every time we go out the door without this reality before us. So what are we supposed to do about it? Look at verse 9. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So two things to note. We are supposed to be actively resisting the devil with the faith. We're supposed to be actively resisting the devil with faith. And two, we're to know that we're not alone in this fight. In other words, if there are other Christians out there in the world, they are experiencing the same struggles that you are. They are part of this fight. They are experiencing the opposition as well. Okay? But I want to focus first on this idea that we are to resist him in the faith. We're to resist him in the faith. In other words, we're to be a part of the resistance. We are the resistance. Uh, we are not to stand on the sidelines watching idly by as the devil has a field day in our homes and in the church and in the world. We are in a spiritual war, friends, and so we are to be fighting. We are to be doing battle. And how are we to do that? Well, he says, by remaining firm in the faith by remaining firm in the faith so that doesn't mean so we don't load up the machine guns right and go outside shooting the, the the guns because physical bullets do nothing to spiritual realities they go right through them they don't harm them so we need spiritual guns and ammo for this battle and god has not left us without weapons of warfare for this fight he has given us tools he has given us weapons to fight this fight. And so what are they? Well, he has given us his word, right? God has not left us in ignorance, uh, but he revealed himself to us and he revealed his will to us. And we are to, uh, we are to know it, we are to hear it, and we are to obey it, right? As we read this morning. But we are also to know it, right? Because the enemy is going to come your way, and when he does, you are going to have to know what God has said. This is what the devil always does. He brings the truth of God into question, and that is how he deceives us and gets us to sin. You think back to the Garden of Eden. What happened? Surely you'll not die if you eat from that tree. But what did God say? The day that you eat from it, you will surely die die, right? And it's no different today. Every time we consume a lie of the devil, it is destructive to our lives every single time. And that is how the devil leads us astray. That is how the devil brings us into bondage by getting us to believe 
untruths, right? So how do we spot the lie, right? How, how do we know that we are dealing with deception when we find it out there in the world? Well, we have to know the truth, right? You have to know the truth to be able to expose the lie. And we also need to obey the truth, right? It's not good enough to hear the truth and to know the truth, but we have to obey the truth. That is, we have to be able to apply the truth of God's word to our lives. And how do we do that? By believing and acting, right? We take the truth, we believe it, and we act upon it. Okay, so it's not enough to hear it's not enough to know, but you must do. You must take the word and apply it. Because the devil, um, when he comes your way, again, you are going to have to know what God has said. Uh, God tells us that our sins have been forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ, and the devil says that's a lie. Right? The devil says... That's a lie. Um, and that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to embrace the lie. He takes, he takes our sin and he holds it over our head when there's no sin hanging over our head whatsoever. And what he does is he uses that to bring us into bondage and into condemnation. And so we have to we have to be able to say, no, all of my sins are forgiven, and I will never have to answer for them. And when we do that, we will be able to live the Christian life that God intended us to live. We will be able to actively oppose the devil. And then we will be able to tell other people how they can expose the lies of the devil and have victory over them and live the way that God intended them to to live. And when they believe the truth and they apply it to their lives, they will have this uh, freedom. And that is how it works. We oppose the devil. We're supposed to resist him in the faith by embracing the truth and rejecting the lie. This is how we do it. We embrace the truth, we consume the truth, and we reject the lie. <clears throat> and one of the most important things that God has given the church to help us do this is one another. And this is getting back to that second uh, point that I mentioned before. He says that you're not alone out there in the world, but that your brothers and your sisters are experiencing the same kinds of trials. And that is why it is so important to be a part of a Christian fellowship. That is why it is so part important to be a part of a Christian community. Because we need other Christians around us to tell us the truth about our sins. Because we're not going to tell ourselves the truth about our sins. We need other Christians around us to point out our blind spots because we can't see them. Right? And we need other Christians around us to hold us accountable. We need to sit regularly together under the authoritative preaching and teaching of God's Word so that we can learn to discern together the difference between the truth and the lie. Because it is very easy to be deceived when you are out there on your own, right? And that is what the devil wants. He wants to catch you out there on your own so that he can deceive you, so that he can uh, keep you in ignorance, and so that he can keep you blind and numb to the truth. And the Christian church is a security. It is a safety net around uh, the Christian that stops the devil from doing this. But he wants to get us uh, deceived. He wants us to be blind and numb to the truth. What are some of the ways that the devil keeps us blind and numb to the truth? Well, one of the primary ways that he does this is by getting us interested in other stuff. He wants us to be consumed with the stuff out there in the world because then he can really exploit us, right? The devil wants you to spend so much time mindlessly surfing on social media that when it's all over with, you don't have any time left 
to do your devotions. And if he does that, he has done his work. And believe me, I've fallen into this trap plenty of times. I fell into it yesterday. <clears throat> the devil wants to get you away from church on Sunday morning. He wants to get you away from the authoritative teaching and preaching of God's word. He wants to get you away from the fellowship of the saints, this security net that I was talking about. Why? Because then he has done his work. Then he can exploit you. He wants, he wants to get you to believe something that is false about your life. He wants to get you to believe a false narrative. Instead of what God says about you, he wants you to believe what he says about you. Instead of believing the gospel, he wants you to believe the lie. Why? Because then he has done his work. Then he can uh, exploit you. Let me ask you a couple questions and we'll finish this point. Would you go outside without thinking carefully about it? About thinking carefully about where you were going to go and how you were going to get there if you knew that there was a lion in the streets? Would you go outside without thinking carefully about your plans, without looking around every corner, without checking before you went if you knew that there was a lion out there in the streets? Well, friends, that is effectively what we do every time we ignore the things of God for the sake of all this other stuff out there in the world. So God is... Lord over our trials, and he has given us weapons to fight our enemies in them. And I would add to that, we must use them. We must use them. We see that second point, God is Lord over our trials, and he will be with us in them, and he will deliver us out of them in verses 10 through 14. I'll read that again. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Excuse me. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. So Peter says up there at the top, after you have suffered a little while, after you've suffered a little while. So what does that assume? Well, that you're going to suffer for a little while. <laughs> but that your suffering is not going to last forever, right? There is a cap on it. It will not continue to endure. God is going to show up and he's going to intervene, and it's as the text says here, he is going to restore you. God himself will restore you. Uh, that is, he is going to put you back together again. He won't allow this trial to be your undoing, right? But he is rather going to use it to complete you. The sufferings that we deal with in this life are the very thing that God uses to make us into a more, a better Christian, a more faithful Christian, a more Christ-like Christian, right? Because remember, that is what God is doing in our lives. He is making us more like Jesus, and you think about Jesus, Jesus suffered and he was delivered, right? As we read in our assurance of pardon last week, he was perfected through sufferings. And that is the very thing that God is doing in your life. So when you go into the trial, you can know that God is already at work in the trial to make you whole again, to bring you into a place of restoration. That is what God is doing in it. He goes on to say, God will confirm, strengthen, and establish us. In other words, I think what he is saying here in total is that he is going to make us rock solid in the faith. God's going to make us rock solid in the faith through our trials. He will confirm us in the faith. He's going to show us that we are his and that we belong to him and that he is ours, right? He's going to strengthen 
our faith or bolster our faith in the trial by teaching us so that we can depend on him so that when those trials come our way in the future, we can face them with confidence, knowing that God will be with us in them and he will deliver us out of them. You see how that works? God delivers us through the trial so that he can bolster our faith, so that he can strengthen our faith, so that he can give us confidence for the future when we face the same kind of hardships. The word establish at the end there literally means to lay a foundation. God is going to lay a foundation for your faith in the trial so that you become a better Christian, so that you become the kind of Christian who lives with both feet on the ground, the kind of Christian that's not shaken by every little noise that they hear hear in the dark, right? You know, the kind of Christian that's not shaken when conflict comes their way or adversity or hardship or pain or whatever, they will know that God is going to be with them in it. Even if death comes their way, they know that that is not the end because death is only the beginning of life everlasting forevermore in the presence of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God strengthens us through the trial in our faith. He strengthens us through the truth of the gospel so that we can endure them so that we can bear up under them the way that he would have us to in the future so that we can effectively become more faithful christians so what does it look like for god to restore confirm strengthen and establish us in the faith well sometimes that means god shows up and he delivers us out of the trial and then once he has delivered you out of the trial and you have victory over it you can look back on that thing and say man that That was tough, that was a struggle, but God delivered me out of it. And what happens as a result, again, is that God confirms or strengthens that person in the faith. They can look at how God was with them in the trial and say that God was faithful. He did what he said he was going to do, right? So he bolsters our faith, and that is what God wants. God wants to grow you as a Christian in your faith. Uh, He wants to make you the kind of Christian that can weather the storm, the kind of Christian that can face trials head on with faith, glorifying Jesus in them. Now, your restoration is not going to be complete in this life, and this is something that we need to get before us. Your restoration is not complete in this life. God is perfecting us in the trial. He is making us more like Jesus Christ in the trial. It's as Peter says here, he has called us to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus. So one day your restoration is going to be complete. One day God will be finished with the work that he has been doing in your life. And then you will be able to look back on all the trials that you faced again and say, man, that was hard. But look at what God has done. Look at what God has done through all of that. And that's the point. So God is Lord over our trials, and he will be with us in them, and he will deliver us out of them. I want to close by looking at these, um, well, really, this... uh, Um, verse here in verse 12 um, by mentioning several of the things that Peter uh, says here uh, well specifically the command that he gives us in verse 12 the exhortation uh, that he makes so let me uh, read that again he says by Salvanus a faithful brother as I regard him I've written briefly to you exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God, stand firm in it. So a couple things first. Uh, Silvanus is uh, most likely the Silas that we know from the rest of the New Testament. And most likely Silas was with Peter when he was writing this letter. He probably wrote the letter for him. He was his amanuensis is what they would call it. Uh, He was his secretary. Peter dictated and uh, Silas wrote, most likely. It's possible that Silas even delivered this letter for Peter and he he expanded on it uh, when he got there. 
to the people to whom he had delivered it. Uh, but Peter tells us here that he had written briefly <laughs> in his letter. Uh, and I think this is our 14th sermon uh, in 1 Peter. And so he has said a lot to us in a short period of time. And there is obviously a lot more that can be said. But Peter effectively sums up here at the end everything that he has been saying by saying that this is the true grace of God, stand firm in it. This is the true grace of God, stand firm in it. So Peter has given us here a manifesto for the faith, a manifesto for the Christian life. And he sums it up by saying that this is the true grace of God, stand in it. In other words, we are to live by faith, practicing obedience to the things that Peter has said to us here in this letter. Enduring trials and hardships when they come our way. Committing ourselves to Jesus Christ, all the while depending on the grace of God to get us through them. And if we do that, <clears throat> uh, at the end of it all, we will be able to say that God was with us. Uh, even in the opposition that we faced, we will truly be able to say that God is good all of the time and in every way. There is no other way. This is the Christian way. And if we follow Peter's directions here, we will live the Christian life the way that it was intended to be lived. That is a life of freedom and victory. So this is how you suffer right. Our series has uh, been called Suffering Right. And so there's a right way to suffer, and you are going to suffer right. And Peter, in his letter, gives us a manifesto, if you will. He gives us a blueprint of how we are to go about doing that uh, in this life. And if we continue to stay the course, if we continue to remain faithful through and through, God will be with us. And as I said, we will be able to say God is good even in it all. God is good all the time and in every way. Let's pray, friends. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for our time in Peter's letter. We thank you for that. Uh, a lot of really important truths contained in this letter. I thank you for enfolding it before us, and I pray that you would keep it before us as we go. I realize that we would forget about it, but we would know it, walk in it, to apply it to our lives. Let us be the kind of people who are privy to the enemy and to his tactics. Be the kind of people who. Uh, who look twice, uh, who know the way uh, to victory, who bring the battle, uh, who bring the weapons with them into the battle and fight hard and fight in faith, all for the glory of Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.